بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so inshallah ta'ala we're continuing <coughs> this is our second week kitab al-shifa we're going to actually continue here with the first chapter uh, there's um, very important points that Qadi Ayyad makes in this chapter, so we'll stick with it. Inshallah ta'ala, we only did the first section last week, which was nine pages, and the first chapter is about 30 pages. Uh, so those who want to follow along in the English translation, this is page 10, part 1, chapter 1, section 2. Section 2 is called uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a witness, and the praise and honor entailed by that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begin, uh, Qadi Iyad, he begins by quoting a verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an exquisitely beautiful ayah from the Qur'an, which is in Surah Al-Ahzab, uh, verses number 45 and 46. Ya ayyuhal nabiyu, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadhira wa da'iyan ila Allahi bi'idhni wa siraja munira. O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news and a warner calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his permission, and as a light-giving lamp. So Qadi Iyad, he says in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endows his prophet with all the ranks of nobility and every praiseworthy quality. He made him a witness over his community by the fact that he has conveyed the message to them. So one of the duties of a prophet is called tabligh. He has to convey the message. That is one of his special qualities. He is a bringer of good news to the people who obey him, a warner to the people who rebel against him. He calls for the oneness of Allah and to worship him. He is a light-giving lamp by which people are guided to the truth. One thing to notice here from uh, a linguistic standpoint, according to Muslim philologists, all of these titles of the Prophet ﷺ in these two ayahs, they're all indefinite nouns. It's called ism nakira. And according to rhetoric, uh, the ism nakira denotes a degree of greatness that is outside of our frames of reference. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَمْ يَكُنِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ حَتَّى تَأْتِئُهُمُ الْبَيِّنَةِ That the, the uh, kufar from the Ahl al-Kitab and from the mushrikeen, they will not break away from their kufr until al-bayyina. That's a definite article. What is al-bayyina? رَسُولٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ a messenger from God, not the messenger of God. Like what a messenger from God uh, who uh, recites purified scriptures. So shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadiran wa da'iyan wa sirajan muniran. These are all indefinite nouns. <clears throat> In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Prophet Sallallahu as a siraj, this word is used four times in the entire Qur'an. If you have a concordance, you can look this up. Three times, it's explicitly talking about the sun, the shams. And here, the Prophet Sallallahu is called siraj. And then this noun is qualified. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. I'm still having throat issues, so I need to drink warm beverages. I'm not contagious. Inshallah, it's not corona. This uh, noun is qualified by the adjective munir. Munir is a form for active participle, ism fa'il, which is related to the word nur, and it means something that spreads light. So a lamp that emanates light and illuminates those around him. So just as the sun illuminates those in its orbit, the Prophet ﷺ illuminates those in his orbit, uh, the Sahaba and any who come into contact with him. Uh, Atai ibn Yasser said, I met Abdullah ibn Amr al-As and said, describe the messenger of Allah to me. He replied, certainly by Allah, some of the characteristics by which he is described in the Quran can also be found in the Torah. Now, in, uh, in hadith or, or statements from the Salaf where the word Torah is mentioned, even in the Quran, the Torah doesn't necessarily mean the first five books of the Christian Bible the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. The word Torah amongst the Bani Israel is a very loose term. In fact, Torah could, be, could signify uh, the, 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 the whole of their corpus of sacred literature. 
So, any, so, any, so Torah could mean uh, a Jewish sacred text of some sort, not necessarily the first five books of Moses. Anyway, so it says, <clears throat> according uh, to Amr, Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, there is a description of the Prophet وسلم, in some sacred Jewish text. O oh, Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news and a warner and a refuge for the unlettered. You are my slave and my messenger. I have called you the one whom people rely, one who is neither coarse nor vulgar and who neither shouts in the markets nor repays evil with evil, but rather pardons and forgives. Allah will not take him back to himself until the crooked community has been straightened out by him. And they say, there is no God but Allah. Through him, blind eyes, deaf ears, and covered hearts will be opened. End quote. Something similar is reported from Abdullah ibn Salam and Ka'ab al-Ahbar. And both of these are scholars of Bani Israel who converted to Islam. Abdullah ibn Salam is a, is a celebrated Sahabi. And Ka'ab al-Ahbar is a Tabi'i. Uh, this is, it seems like to me, this is a commentary, a paraphrase and a commentary of a passage uh, in the Hebrew Bible, which is called Isaiah chapter 42 um, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. It's also found in the Christian Bible. I believe that Isaiah chapter 42 is a clear Muhammadan typology, a foreshadowing of the Prophet Sallallahu I'll just give you a few highlights uh, from that chapter in the Bible. The Hebrew says, Hen abdi if machbo. Behold my abd, my servant. So we're going to have a description of someone whose primary title is abd. And of course, the primary title of the Prophet Sallallahu in the Quran is abd. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi. Alhamdulillahi ladhi anzala ala abdihi al kitaba. Tabaraka ladhi nazala al furqana ala abdihi. And so forth. Fa'awha ila abdihi ma awha. This is his primary title. Behold my servant whom I uphold. The Hebrew of Isaiah 42 continues, Bikhri ratsa nafshi, in whom my soul delights. And then it says, Nafati ruhi alive. I've put my ruh upon him. The speaker is obviously God here. And he's saying that I have put my ruh upon this abd, my spirit of inspiration, my spirit of guidance, my spirit of revelation. Mishpat le goyim yutsi. He will bring judgment or law in order to the goyim. Goyim is a Hebrew word meaning Gentiles, non Jews. The word in Arabic for goy, which is the singular of goyim, is ummi. Ummi. So the Prophet is called an Nabiul ummi in the Quran. This has different meanings the unlettered prophet or the Gentile prophet. This is one of the meanings of Nabiul ummi. The Gentile prophet, the prophet that was prophesized, the non-Jewish Gentile prophet, the universal messenger. And then it says, interestingly, again, Isaiah 42, Lo in the Hebrew, which means he will not raise his voice in the marketplace. And our mother Aisha, she described the Prophet وسلم, exactly with these words. fil aswaq. He doesn't raise his voice in the marketplace. And this is an indication, this is a way of saying that the Prophet's character was very mild, mild-mannered, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is how he's actually described by Sayyidina Ali in the famous hadith in the Shema'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi, Sahlul khuluki, layinul janibi, that he's easygoing, mild-mannered. This is how he's described in the Torah, in this passage, in this sacred Hebrew Jewish text. And then it goes on to say in Isaiah 42, it calls this abd birit am. Birit means mithaq. And am means am, general, universal, a universal covenant. This, this abd, this prophet, this unlettered prophet, this Gentile prophet is alamiyah. Right? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رُسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا And then it says, or goyim. He is or goyim in Hebrew. If I were to translate that into Arabic, it would be nurul ummiyin. He is nurul ummiyin. He is the light of the Gentiles. He is the light of the unlettered. And then it goes on to talk about how the Kedarites are going to uh, adopt this prophet's message. The Kedarites are descendants of someone named Qaidar. Qaidar, according to Ibn Hisham, 
is one of the sons of Ismail alayhi salam. And Ibn Hisham, he traces the Prophet's ancestry, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, all the way back to Qaydar or Kedar. In fact, in, in Hebrew, uh, a very popular way of saying Arabic is to say Laishan Qaydar, the tongue, Lisan of, of Qaydar. <clears throat> And then Qadi Iyad, he quotes the ayah, the famous ayah in the Qur'an. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَ الْأُمِّي الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُ فِي تُرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, the Gentile prophet. Nabi al-Ummi also means the motherly prophet, like the nurturing prophet, uh, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and in the Injil and in the Gospel, commanding them to the right, forbidding them uh, from wrong, making lawful for them the good things and making unlawful for them the foul things, relieving from them their burdens and the fetters that are on them, those who believe in him and aid him and help him and follow the light which has been sent down to him. They are the prosperous. This is Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, verse 157. <clears throat> There's a famous uh, um, Jewish scholar who became a Muslim. He's a 12th century Jewish scholar, his name was Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. A lot of people don't know about him. He was actually the son of a Moroccan rabbi. And he converted to Islam based on a dream he had. Um, and then he wrote this incredible book called Ifhamul Yahud, The Confounding of the Jews, in which he argues against Judaism and for Islam. And he argues for the uh, messiahship of Isa alayhi salam. Very interesting book. And there's an autobiographical element in his book, The Confounding of the Jews, by Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. So he tells us how he became a Muslim. He said that he was, he was sleeping, he had a dream. In his dream, he sees this very old man sitting under a tree. <clears throat> so he approaches the man, and the man identifies himself as the prophet Samuel. This is a prophet in the Old Testament. He might be mentioned in the Quran indirectly as a Nabi Ba'd Musa, a prophet after Moses, peace be upon him. So then Shamuel, the prophet Samuel, begins to quote something from the Torah to Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. And he quotes to him Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. This is a famous passage in the Hebrew Bible that says, Nabi Akim lahem so on and so forth. That, that God is the speaker and he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet from the brethren of the Israelites who's going to be like Moses, a prophet like Moses. And I shall put my words into this prophet's mouth. And, I, and whatever he says is only by command. Right? So then uh, um, uh, Shamuel, he says to the prophet Samuel, that's you, right? We were taught that that prophet is you. And then he said that the prophet Samuel became angry and stood up and walked away from him. And then he said he woke up suddenly. And then he said he fell back asleep. And it was just before Fajr. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, bil ashar. The most true dreams are just before Fajr, during the time of Suhoor. So he says he fell asleep again, and he said he woke up, he had another dream. He's walking down a corridor into a courtyard, and a man passes him, and the man says to him, Ati' Rasulallah, obey the Messenger of God. And he comes into the courtyard, and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, and he said the prophet was very busy. He was preparing for a ghazwa, a military expedition. So Shamuel, he goes right up to the prophet, وسلم, and he says he takes the prophet's hand, and he says, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah. And he took great pride that, he, that the prophet himself took his shahada in his dream. Now, he couldn't actually voice, uh, he couldn't admit that he'd become Muslim because there was a dangerous situation for him. His father was a rabbi. But years later, he did. But he made it a point in his autobiography that I was able to say, Annaka, and I bear witness that you are the messenger of God, rather than Muhammad Rasulullah. It's a very interesting text. <clears throat> anyway, the, the dominant opinion is that, um, uh, or a strong opinion, is that many of the uh, descriptions of the Prophet وسلم, have been lifted from the Torah and the Gospel and that the text has been corrupted as tahrifu nas Imam al-Razi doesn't necessarily agree with this and says, if you look hard enough, you'll find that there are, in fact, uh, descriptions of him. It, but it takes a sort of more sophisticated analysis. And then uh, Qadi Iyad, he mentions this beautiful ayah from Surah Ali Imran, verse 159. 
this iconic ayah, which sort of demonstrates uh, the description of the Prophet we've been talking about. The verse begins, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَهُمْ If you know something about Arabic, you know this ma is ma as zaida فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ So it is part of the incredible mercy <clears throat> from Allah that you are lenient with them. <clears throat> if you had been harsh, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ فَاعْفُوا عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ If you had been harsh or hard-hearted, you would have seen men scatter from your presence. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them. In the ulama say, pardon them means that you know, if people transgress against you personally, just forgive them. If people transgress against the hudud of Allah, then ask Allah to forgive them. Make istighfar for them. And consult them in, 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 uh, in the affair. And this means the political affairs. The ulama ask a question here. Why would the Prophet وسلم, whose speech is wahi and who has isma, why would he consult people about political affairs? So Imam al-Razi says he's doing this to simply set a precedent. Right? Because he's the last prophet. Muslim leaders who come after him are no prophets. They could make mistakes. So he's setting a precedent that you have to con conduct your affairs through a shura, through a, a mutual consultation of some point, of some sort, uh, to ensure that uh, a tyranny doesn't arise. Wallahu alam. <clears throat> As Samarqandi said, Allah's reminding them that he made his messenger merciful to the believers, <clears throat> compassionate and lenient. <clears throat> if he had been harsh and severe in speech, they would have left him. However, Allah made him magnanimous, easygoing, cheerful, kind, and gentle. One of the names of the Prophet وسلم, according to Imam Suyuti, is ad the smiling prophet, the laughing prophet. Easygoing. He's able to diffuse situations. Even with some humor, he can diffuse situations. Right? <clears throat> One of my favorite examples, hadith in Bukhari, very famous hadith. The Prophet وسلم, is walking in Medina, his city. He's the head of state with Aisha and a group of Yahud, and there was some animosity between them during this time between the Muslims and the Yahud. A group of Yahud pass him by, and one of them says, Assalamu alaikum. And the Prophet وسلم, immediately responds, Wa alaikum. Uh, and uh, so, Assalamu alaikum means, May death be upon you. Right? And this is an interesting, this is a good principle. The Prophet وسلم, he said that the mu'min is mutawadir, but he's not dhalil. There's a difference. The mu'min is humble, but he's never humiliated. The Muslim does not humiliate himself. The Muslim has self-respect. The Muslim is not a doormat. So very quickly, he's wa alaykum. And then Aisha thought that the Prophet didn't hear them correctly. Right? She thought that the Prophet heard, assalamu alaykum. So she turns around and she says, wassalamu alaykum, wa la'natullah, wa ghadaballah alaykum. Uh, and death be upon you, and the anger and wrath of God, and, and the curse of God. And the Prophet said, oh, mahalan, mahalan, like take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. Inna allaha yuhibbu rifq he said. This is what he told her. Inna allaha yuhibbu rifq fil amri kulli. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves uh, gentleness in all affairs. He's the head of state in, in Medina. You know, people get angry now because, you know, they're at a grocery store or something and somebody, you know, says, oh, look at this Muslim, you know, camel jockey or whatnot. This, the, the Prophet's in Medina. I mean, obviously things like that, you know, should be addressed, but this is what you should expect. But in Medina, in his own city, when he's the head of state, this is happening to him. And look at his response. Man yuhram al-rifq, yuhram al-khair. This hadith in Muslim. Whoever is deprived of gentleness is deprived of good. <clears throat> so Aisha said, didn't you hear what they said? And he said, didn't you hear what I said? <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so continuing, Qadi Iyad, he quotes this verse, Al-Baqarah 143, Thus we have made you a middle community, so that you... The Prophet 
would be, a, uh, uh, would be sorry, that you, uh, the Muslims, would be witnesses against people and so that the messenger would be a witness against you. Abu al-Hasan al-Qabisi said, in this ayah, Allah makes it clear the excellence of our Prophet and the excellence uh, of his community. The Ummah Wasata, the middle nation. This is verse 143 of 286, right in the middle of Al-Baqarah. So with respect to theology, I might have mentioned this here last time, or maybe it was the other masjid. Imam al-Razi says that with respect to theology, uh, we, are, we do not uh, practice what's known as tashbih, which is a Christian practice, the practice of the mujassima, the anthropomorphous, the Christians, they put Allah in his creation. They believe in incarnationalist theology, that God dwelled within his creation. Um, or the other extreme, Jewish theology, ta'atil, also mu'tazili theology, that God is so transcendent that they started to deny that he even has attributes. With respect to Christology, the, the Jewish position, with respect to Isa alayhi salam, the Jewish position is that he is a human, non-divine, false prophet. The Christian position is that he is a human, divine prophet. Divine. Right? So this is based on a doctrine or dogma they have called hypostatic union. That Isa alayhi salam is a human being with two natures. He's 100% God and 100% man. The Muslim position is that he was a human non-divine prophet. So the essence is human, the particular is prophet. That's the what and the who of Islamic Christology. With respect to the practical aspect, the most virtuous lifestyle for Catholic Christians is to join a religious order and take vows of chastity and poverty. So to be poor and celibate is the most virtuous type of lifestyle. For Protestants, one is saved by faith alone. This is a doctrine called sola fide. Ultimately, good works do not factor in at all, at all, uh, when it comes to one's salvation. So this leads to a type of antinomianism. This is one of those fancy words that academics use. Antinomianism means a rejection of sharia. People who reject the sharia, there's nothing to ground them. So they start making claims. For Jews, at least the Orthodox and Conservative, the most virtuous life is where one or a person tries to complete all of the 613 commandments mentioned in the Torah, a project that could take several lifetimes. So a lot of people don't know this, but Orthodox Jews believe in reincarnation. It's, it's, a, it's a traditional Orthodox belief. It's called Gilgul HaNeshama in Hebrew. In other words, the, the Jewish Sharia, the Halakha of Bani Israel, it is so vast, it's so cumbersome, right? That it takes several lifetimes, and you have to do all the commandments. <clears throat> In Islam, there's a balance, according to the Hadith of Gabriel. Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Islam in this context means outward submission. Iman meaning an inward submission, inward belief, and then ihsan is the relational aspect. And if there's deficiency in good deeds, uh, then there's, there's purification in the grave. There's adhab al-qabr. There's a hard hisab or hard reckoning on the yawm al-qiyamah. Uh, there's even, according to the Sunni tradition, uh, some of the muwahidun, some of the monotheists that were lax in their prayer and things like that. There's a purification in Jahannam, uh, and they'll come out of that eventually. So good works means, means something. U ultimately, we're saved by grace. Man qala la ilaha illallah bi-sidqin dakhal al-jannah. Eventually, inshallah ta'ala. So it's a middle way. The Prophet, the, the Quran says, eat and drink, but not to excess. The Prophet said, An-nikah sunnati. Marriage is my sunnah, my normative practice. Whoever turns away from my practice is not from me. <clears throat> so these are all sort of the aspects of the umma wasata, ummatan wasata. <clears throat> Allah says in another ayah, 
In this, the messenger is a witness against you, and you are witnesses against the people. And then he quotes this fam famous verse, uh, verse 41 from An Nisa. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَا أُولَئِ شَهِيدٍ How will it be when we bring a witness from every community and we bring you as a witness against these? And the Prophet وسلم, he, he had uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recite this ayah. And when he got to this surah, when he got to this ayah, the Prophet began to weep according to the hadith. So he means balanced and good. Balanced community. Balance is always seen as something that's good. And this is, you know, this is transhistorical, transcendental. Even if you go to Eastern philosophy, the way of the Buddha is the middle way. Uh, if you go uh, to Confucius, the middle way. Ancient Greek philosophy, Plato said, mede agan in Greek, which means never in excess. And he's talking about good things, not bad things. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he quotes this other ayah here from Surah Yunus, ayah number two. <clears throat> Give good news to those who believe that they have a sure footing with their Lord. And Qatada, Hassan al-Basri, Zayd ibn Aslam, these are champions of the Tabi'een. They said the sure footing, the Qadam al-Sidqin, mentioned in this ayah, Surah Yunus, ayah number two, chapter 10, verse two is the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who is a Sahabi, said the same thing. Sahala Tustari said, it's the preordained mercy which Allah placed in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sahala Tustari is a third century scholar from Persia. So you know he's really smart. <laughs> Persian, anyway. Um, there's another verse here. I, I skipped over it last week, but verse 256 of Al-Baqarah. This is right after Ayatul Kursi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever believes in Allah has taken hold of the firmest handle, Al-Urwatul Wuthqa. Al-Urwatul Wuthqa. And Abdurrahman al-Sulami said, this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So he is sure footing and a firm handhold. So you can think of an analogy. Imagine a parable. Imagine you have to climb the face of a steep mountain. And you have a friend at the top of the mountain who throws down to you a safety cable. He says, tie this around your waist. So you tie the safety cable around your waist. And then your friend tells you exactly where to put your feet in your hands. Put your hand here. Put your foot here. Put your hand here. So in this parable, your friend at the top is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only a parable. Walillahi al-mathal al-a'ala. The goal is to reach him. He throws down to you a, uh, a lifeline, a uh, safety cable. Habalullah. Uh, this is the analogy used. Hold on tightly, all of you, to the cable extension, the safety line, the safety rope, the safety cable, however you want to say it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends down for you. And then the hand holds and the foot holds. Qadam al sidqin al ulwat al wuthqa. These are the sunnah. These are the sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the steep hill represents the dunya. How do we get through the dunya and meet our friend at the top, as it were? Is we have the Quran and sunnah. Hablullah, qadam al sidqin al ulwat al wuthqa. There are some who tie the rope around their waist and they reject the footholds and the handholds. They say, I don't need this. I'll find my own way. So they start climbing, and they slip. And then the rope right, catches them from falling. They climb some more, and they slip. And the rope catches them, and they almost get to the top. The rope snaps, and they fall, and they're doomed. Because there's no separating the Quran from Sunnah. It's an illogical position. The Quran says, Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul. Obey Allah, obey Allah, which means obey the Quran. And obey Rasul. What is that? Sunnah. It's an illogical position. It doesn't make any sense. It's like someone says, I only follow the Quran and they drink alcohol. You only follow the Quran? Really? <clears throat> Section three now. Let's see what we're doing on time. It's halfway there. Any questions? 
clarifying questions or everything's okay? No? All right, section three concerning Allah's kindness and gentleness to him. So Qadi Iyad, he quotes this ayah, which is ayah 43 of At-Tawbah, 943. Allah has pardoned you. Why did you give them leave before it was clear to you which of them spoke the truth and you knew the liars? So the Prophet وسلم, is being admonished here, is reprimanded here by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this happens a few times, a couple of times in the Quran. Samarqandi said that, that Allah, that, uh, that one of the people of knowledge said, Allah has protected, the meaning of, of Allah has pardoned you is that Allah has protected you sound of heart. Why did you then give them leave? He says, if the Prophet had first been addressed with the words, why did you give them leave? If that was the beginning of the ayah, lima adhinta lahum, he says, his heart might have burst out of terror at these words. A direct reprimand from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him first of pardon by his mercy so that his heart would remain calm. And only then did he say to him, lima adhinta lahum, why did you give them leave? So the Prophet sallallahu he gave some men permission to stay behind and not go out for the tabuk expedition. So his point here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the reprimand to his habib by saying, Afallahu ank. Oh, I've already forgiven you, but why did you, why did you give them leave? <laughs> and this is different. If Allah would have said, Ghafara Allahu lak, Ghafara, right? Ghafara, uh, according to Imam al Ghazali, this is one of you know, the names of Al Ghafir, Al Ghafur, Al Ghaffar. Ghafara means to conceal something, according to Imam al Ghazali, in its etymology. To conceal it, but it's still kind of there. But ala afu, Allah is the effacer. Afa Allahu ank. Erased it completely. So Imam al Ghazali says this is more effectual. This is, this is more uh, soothing to the heart that, that here Allah began. Afa Allahu ank. It's completely gone. But why did you give them leave? This shows the high station with Allah, says Qadi Iyad, which is not hidden from anyone with the least intelligence. It shows the honor by which he holds his prophet and his kindness to him. And if the whole of it were known, the heart would burst. The same applies to the words. We know that what they say grieves you. Qad na'lamu innahu layahzunuka alladhi yaqulun. We know that what they say grieves you, gives you huzun. فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ It is not you they call a liar, but the evildoers. It is the signs of Allah, the ayatullah, that they deny. So what is the ayah saying? The mushrikeen did not doubt the sincerity of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam al-Tabari, Imam al-Zamakhshari, they mention that they nicknamed him as sadiq al-Amin. That was their name for him. It's not a name given in the Quran or Hadith, although he's called Amin and Sadiq in sacred text as well. But this is before the, the Bi'tha. They claimed, they claimed that the Prophet was sort of sincerely deluded. But this was also just an excuse. This is not accurate as well, because the ayah said, يجحدون, They have juhud in Arabic. The, the verb yajhadun comes from the word juhud, kufur juhud, is to know something is true in your heart, but you just can't bring yourself to acknowledge it with the tongue. You hold a belief in the qalb, but it's not going to manifest on the tongue. Why? Out of arrogance or some sort of ulterior motive, desire, or out of spite, right? People who just can't admit they're wrong about something. Ali said that Abu Jahl told the Prophet, we do not call you a liar. We say that what you have brought is a lie. So Allah revealed this ayah. It is also related that the Prophet was distressed when his people cried lies against him. So Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, why are you distressed? He said, my people have called me a liar. Jibril said, they know that you are telling the truth. Then Allah sent down this ayah. So this was very shocking to the Prophet ﷺ. These people who always loved him and trusted him and gave him these lofty titles, just suddenly accusing him of being a liar. You know, I don't know if 
if I can give an adequate analogy. You know who Galileo was? He's an Italian astronomer from the 17th century. You guys know Galileo. Galileo probably had a 200 IQ. And uh, he was a Catholic. And uh, so he was a genius. Everyone knew he was a genius. Imagine like he goes to some of his colleagues and he says, you know, I think it's heliocentrism. I think the Earth is going around the sun. And they say, what are you, stupid? Imagine how that would hit him. How can I be stupid? I'm Galileo. You, you're, you've called me a genius my whole life. And now I'm suddenly stupid? It doesn't make any sense. You just don't like what I'm saying because it, there's, there's something about your doctrine that it doesn't sit well with you. It's like the uh, allegory in the caves that Plato gives in the Republic. These people sitting in the cave looking at shadows on the wall. One man gets up and he sees the actual forms, the, the reality of what's casting the shadows. So he goes back to the people and he says, this is fake. This is a reflection. Reality is outside. And they say, shut up and sit down. You don't know what you're talking about. And they start beating him. So he sits down. But now he's blind. He can't see the shadows anymore. People just get... Uh, they get comfortable in their ways. Right? So, Imam at tabari says, the real reason why they rejected the Qur'an is because of their moral stubbornness. They did not want to be moral people. They enjoyed their hedonistic lifestyles. <clears throat> so the Prophet's uh, theocentrism, he put God at the center, his moral principles would compromise their positions of power and influence and pleasure so most of the mushrikeen actually respected the Prophet ﷺ. They respected him, but they could not accept his message. Conversely, most of the Bani Israel in Yathrib, in Medina to Munawwara, they, they respected his message. It's Tawheed, but they can't accept the man because he's not, he's not Jewish. He's Arab, and there was a prevalent belief amongst them. I mean, systematic Jewish theology wasn't born for another 400 years. Apparently, there was a belief that there are no Gentile prophets. The Hadith says that many of the Jews in Medina did believe he was a prophet. And Bukhari says that there's a, he relates a Hadith that they would sneeze in his presence on purpose. See him walk by, Hachu. And then the Prophet would say, Yarhamukum Allah. And he said, Amin. Because they, they thought he was a prophet, but he's for the Arabs. He's not for us. Right? This type of thing. <clears throat> All right. Oh, by the way, that verse, we know, we know that what they say grieves you. It is not you they call a liar, but the evildoers. That's Surah Al-An'am, chapter 6, verse 33. <clears throat> now on page 14. Then Allah consoles him. This is the second full paragraph. Then Allah consoles him and makes him rejoice by what he says about those before and the promise of his help to come. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu in the next ayah, ayah 34, Surah Al-An'am, وَلَقَدْ كُذِّبَتْ رُسُلٌ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Messengers before you were belied. فَصَبَرُوا عَلَى مَا كُذِّبُوا And they endured patiently that they were called liars. وَأُوذُوا And they suffered. حَتَّى أَتَاهُمْ نَصْرُنَا Until our help came to them. And then Qadi Iyadi mentions among the things that are mentioned about his special qualities, the khasais of the Prophet وسلم, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses the other prophets by their actual first names, the ism alam. Ya Adam, Ya Nuh, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Musa, Ya Dawood, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, Ya Zakaria, Ya Yahya. But he never says Ya Muhammad in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the title of the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Ayyuhar Rasul, Ya Ayyuhan Nabiyu, Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammil, Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. Section 4, concerning Allah swearing by His imminent, uh, by His immense worth. Allah quotes the ayah, 72, Surah Al-Hijr, La Amruka, La In by your life, 
Allah takes an oath by the life of the Prophet They are wandering about in their drunkenness. And Ibn Abbas said, I have not heard that Allah made an oath by the life of any other person. Allah did not create, originate, or make any soul that he honored more than the soul of the Prophet Allah says, Yasin wal Quran al Hakim. What surah is this? Yes, I think that's good. The commentators disagree about the meaning of Yasin, saying different things about it. Abu Muhammad Maki related that the Prophet said, I have ten names with my Lord. I think this hadith is in the Shema'il as well. He mentioned Taha and Yasin. So these are from the Ayat Mutashabihat. Right? These, are, these are obscure verses that are not definitively established in their meanings. There are 29 suwar of the Quran that begin with these muqatta'at, uh, uh, as they're called, these disjointed letters, alif lam mim, alif lam ra, hamim, yasin, qaf, noon, kafa, ya'in, sat. So Allahu alam, some, some of the ulama engaged in a ta'wil. Ta'wil is like an esoteric exegesis. But all of them say Allahu alam, nobody really knows. But that's the thing about a scholar, you say. Nobody knows, and they say, well, maybe it means this. Allahu alam. <laughs> Uh, Abdul Rahman al Sulami said, a Jafar al Sadiq, who was a great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, by the way. Jafar al Sadiq is the sixth Imam of the Shia, but this, we, we claim him as a Sunni Imam. He was the teacher of Malik ibn Anas in Abu Hanifa. He's the great, great, great grandson of the Prophet. Imam Jafar al Sadiq. He said, The meaning of Yasin is Ya Sayyid addressing the Prophet There's a popular book that some of our brethren love called Kitab al-Tawheed by uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. Very popular book where he says that calling the Prophet Sayyid is not preferable. He quotes a hadith of Abu Dawood, but he classifies it as weak. But he says, nonetheless, he quotes the hadith that a waft, a delegation from Bani Amr, came to the Prophet وسلم, and they said, Anta Sayyiduna, you are our Sayyid. And the Prophet said, A Sayyid Allah. Allah is the Sayyid. And then he continued, وسلم, don't let Shaitan provoke you. In other words, be careful about exaggerating my status. This is not a prohibition against calling him Sayyid. He is a Sayyid. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Inna ibni hadha Sayyidun. Who is he talking about? Imam Hassan, his grandson. How can Imam Hassan be a Sayyid, but the Prophet وسلم, is not Sayyid, or it's not preferable to call him Sayyid? The Prophet said in a hadith that is absolutely sound Bukhari and Tirmidhi, Ana Sayyidu waladi Adam, wala fakhr. I am the master of the children of Adam. And it's not a boast. This is the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about Yahya alayhi salam. And the maqam of Yahya is not the maqam of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Yahya is not even from the ulul azm in al-rusul. Anna Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya musaddiqan bi kalimatin min Allahi wa sayyidan wa hasura. That Yahya is called Sayyid. So if you know your aqidah, then it is preferable to refer to the Prophet وسلم, as Sayyid, because this is the reality. If you don't know aqidah and you're using terms for Allah and for the Prophet, then, right? Like the Prophet وسلم, he said, don't write down the hadith initially so that it's not confused with the Quran. But when you become familiar with the Quran, you become familiar with the hadith, then start recording things, record my hadith. This is why when you make like, when you make da'wah to someone, you don't, you should, the first, you, sh, you, sh, you, know, you shouldn't be talking about jinn in, in, in your first da'wah attempt, right? You should talk about tawheed, right? Or you start, you know, giving expositions of the sharia and things like that. You're going to lose people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif, Lam, Meem, Lalika al-Kitab, La-Rayba fi. 
Ibn Abbas said that these letters are oaths, qasam, by which Allah swears. He and other people have said various things. Sahala Tustari said, Alif is Allah. Lam is Jibreel. And Mim is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahu alam. Section 5, concerning Allah's oath to, con to confirm his place with him. So here, Qadi Iyad, he quotes the entire surah, Wadduha. The translation says surah 94, but that's incorrect. Surah 93. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Imam Suti, by the way, he says about this surah, surah 93, Wadduha, as well as Al-Inshirah, the surah that follows after it. Imam Suti says in the Itqan, and this is one of, one of three or four times in which the Prophet ﷺ received a surah through interior locution without angelic mediation. That this surah was placed directly into his heart, directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the mediation of Jibreel alayhi salam. وَالْدُّحَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى she translates, your Lord has, so by the forenoon and the night when it is still, your Lord has neither forsaken you nor hates you. So the, the Arabic doesn't say you. Qala, naqala ka. Right? Even though qala is a fi'il muta'addi, you know, generally requires a direct object, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give a direct object because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never hint that he hates the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why, was, why would Allah say this? Your Lord has not forsaken you, nor does he hate. And it's understood you, but he doesn't say that. It's because, according to the uh, tafsir, the asbab al nuzul that there was a break in the revelation for a few days or months. There's a difference of opinion. Some of the mushrikeen were making fun of the Prophet ﷺ, and they say things like, inna rabbahu wa da'ahu wa qalahu, his Lord has forsaken him and he hates him. What is later is better than what is former. That's literally what it says. The afterlife is better than a dunya, but the Arabic doesn't say dunya. Khairu mina dunya. You know, ula. It could mean dunya. The afterlife is better than the, the dunya for you. Or you can take it to mean what comes later is better than what's happening now. There's going to be Medina later. That's better. There's still going to be problems in Medina. That's life. But it's going to be better than now. And sofa. Sofa is used in Arabic for distant future. It's going to take some time, but eventually your Lord will give you something, and immediately you're going to be pleased. But you have to go through some, some trials. According to Abu Nu'im, Imam al-Daylami, the Prophet وسلم, said, Lan arda wa wahidun min ummati fin nar. I will never be pleased while one person from my ummah is in the fire. When this ayah, ayah was revealed, um, that, Wa la sofa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Soon will your Lord give you something and you'll be pleased. What will the Lord give him? Kawthar, the shafa'a. Make him head of state in Medina. All of these things come in the future. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that the Allah? No. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, 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 he gives us three rhetorical questions. He gives the Prophet three rhetorical questions as reminders of past blessings. And this is a good way of dealing with depression. The Prophet was a little bit down during this time. And psychologists say that a good way of coming out of depression is just remind yourself of the blessings in your life. Sit down and just think about the blessings. What's happened in the past? Alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa? Were you not, uh, did he not find you an orphan and give you shelter? His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. His grandfather died when he was eight. Abu Talib raised him. Abu Talib was the means by which Allah sheltered his prophet. And the prophet returned the favor, by the way. When Abu Talib was much older, he had some financial issues, and he couldn't take care of all of his sons. So the Prophet said, give me one. He said, here, take Ali. And Sayyidina Ali was raised in the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet in the house of the Prophet 
وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى This is a bad translation that she made here. Did he not find you misguided? That's a terrible translation. Dalan here does not mean misguided. It means to be searching for something, wandering. Is it written? Oh, shut up. That's good. I have an old edition. Any questions? Yeah. It, it signifies um, a, type of, a type of greatness in that object itself. And this is something that the pre-Islamic Arabs, the, the shu'ara, the poets, would have recognized. So the, the Quran is not poetry, but it is poetic. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is appealing to the, the initial audience of the Quran. And so the initial audience are seventh century Arabs that are extremely gifted in poetry. Right? Now the interesting thing about the Quran is, according to Imam Baqilani, it doesn't fit any of the meters of Jahli poetry. And this is what Al-Baqilani considers to be sort of an element of the ijaz of the Qur'an, element of the sort of inimitability of the Qur'an, is that it's just unclassifiable. Right? The Arabs didn't know what to do with it. But pre-Islamic Arab poetry had these types of oath statements, oath clusters, as they're called. Right? Um, so it, it appealed to their sort of tastes, and they knew that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath by something, then that thing must be great, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only takes oaths uh, by great things in the Quran, and we can only take oaths by Allah. We say, wallahi, we don't take oaths by anything else. Any other qu questions? I just want to finish this part right here, inshallah. Yes, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. the question, just comparing the, the afu that the Prophet asked for compared to the afu that, that, or not that the Prophet asked for, but that was given to the Prophet compared to the Prophet, compared to the afu that we... Yeah, uh, so according to our prophetology, a, a, a Prophet is, any Prophet is, is incapable of consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they can make errors in judgment. 
So this was a, a, a slip in the, in the judgment of the Prophet ﷺ because he's not all-knowing. He, he doesn't, he's not infallible in that sense that Allah is perfect. Right? So prophets can make errors in judgment. Yunus alayhi salam, um, according to his judgment, these people in Nineveh, they're not going to believe in the Tawheed. So he said to himself, let me go to a different city for the da'wah. But he didn't take permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah dealt with him harshly because the higher the maqam, the more that's expected from you. Right? Um, so that's why you know, sometimes you have someone who has a lot of knowledge, it might even be a hafiz of Quran, who is really not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And things go really bad in his life, really bad. Because there's a high expectation from this person. Right? Um, as far as us, we commit, you know, kaba'ir sin. Um, uh, so when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for afwa, we're asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to completely efface all of those sins. Whereas with the Prophet sallam, all those minor sort of slips of errors and judgments are effaced. Um, so one of, the, one of the favorite du'as of the Prophet sallallahu is, Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibbu al-afwa, fa'afu anna. Right? This is one of his most favorite du'as, especially during the month of Ramadan. Right? Um, so, inshallah ta'ala, um, make du'a, call on the name al-afu, that on the yawm al-qiyamah, these things that we do are completely just erased from the record. There's no trace of them. That's what it means. Two minutes left, okay. Any other questions from the sister side? Yeah, I just wanted to make that comment. So it's been corrected, wandering instead of misguided. That the Prophet ﷺ was searching for a sharia, a revealed law. Um, he never strayed from tawheed, um, and he was never immoral even by the standards of the sharia, even before the sharia. Uh, he was from the Hunafa, he was from the Abraham, Abrahamic monotheists who were still around in Mecca at the time. He never worshipped idols. Did he not find you needy and enrich you? So Imam al baghawi here says that this is a reference to our mother Khadija al Kubra, that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet وسلم, of the blessing of a good and supportive wife she was his first disciple, that she encouraged him. There's a hadith in Abu Dawood that we're told that years after the death of Khadija, when the Prophet ﷺ was living in Medina, uh, a necklace once owned by Khadija was brought to Medina in order to ransom one of the captives at Badr. And Aisha says, when the Prophet saw it, raqqa laha riqqatan shadidatan, that he had this like, intense sensitivity and tenderness was just an object from his first wife because she, he had remembered how much he had. Well, that's the iqama. We'll continue next week, inshallah.